China is battling a new and rapidly spreading respiratory virus. The number of people infected has tripled to more than 200. And President Xi says it needs to be resolutely contained. Public Health England has informed us that one of our students has tested positive for coronavirus. This is one of two individuals who tested positive for the virus in the city. We're deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and by the alarming levels of inaction. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. The Prime Minister has announced the most drastic limits to our lives that the UK has ever seen in living memory. The aim, he says, is to save lives in this time of national emergency. The world has changed a lot over the past year. Unprecedented changes have almost become the norm. One thing, however, stands resolutely clear. The role science, chemistry, and in particular polymers have played in safeguarding and guiding us through the pandemic. From essential PPE supplies protecting the front line, to newfound therapeutics for the disease, to vaccines preventing serious illness, polymers have performed a key role in all. Polymers are macromolecules, a molecule containing a very large number of atoms, and are themselves a substance which has a molecular structure built up chiefly or completely from a large number of similar units bonded together. Polymers can be found everywhere around us and are a fundamental part of our lives. Natural polymers literally exist within us in the forms of protein, DNA and polysaccharides, and the likelihood is that not a day will go by without you using something synthetic polymer based. It can be synthesized through two methods, chain growth and step growth mechanisms. In a step growth polymerization, both monomers and growing chains have reactive groups and both species can react together forming longer chains. On the other hand, monomers are just added one by one onto the chain in chain growth polymerization. Both processes are crucial for the formation of many well-known polymers. All syntheses go through the process of being initiated, where the f chain formation starts, propagated, where the chain is extended through further monomer addition, and terminated, where the extension of the chain comes to an end. A few common types of polymerizations include free radical polymerizations, cationic polymerizations, which involve an electrophilic polymer, and anionic polymerizations, which include a nucleophilic polymer. Now that we briefly know how different types of polymer are formed, what are the polymers that have been weaponized against COVID-19 and how are they combating the disease? Polymers have been at the forefront of our defense to COVID-19 from the outset of the pandemic, whether this be through essential medical applications, such as medical devices and treatments, to the items of personal protective equipment, PPE, that NHS and frontline staff now wear day in, day out to protect themselves and their patients. PPE has been essential to our collective pandemic response, and it is factual to state that it saves lives. In fact, according to a recent study, further global investment ensuring all healthcare workers have adequate PPE supplies, especially those in lower income countries where it is scarcer, would potentially save 2,299,543 lives. Let's have a look at some common forms of PPE I'm sure we've all become accustomed to over the past year. How about face coverings? There's been a lot of news, both legitimate and fake, surrounding the wearing of face coverings. However, by general consensus, face coverings save lives. In fact, a report published in PubMed in the United States estimated that if 95% of the American population wore face coverings from September 2020, 129,574 lives could have been saved by 2021. Surgical type IIR face masks are commonplace pieces of PPE nowadays. Most are made from a common polymer, polypropylene, as a non-woven fabric. The monomer for polypropylene, propylene, or more commonly known as propene, is added in a chain growth mechanism to produce polypropylene. As this polymer is a thermoplastic polymer, its properties change upon heating to become more malleable and set again upon cooling, it can be melt blown into non-woven fabric sheets. Non-woven melt blown fabrics are porous, as a result they can filter liquids and gases. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the price of melt blown spiked from a few thousand US dollars per tonne to approximately 100,000 US dollars per tonne. Non-woven sheet products are now being, also being trialled for use 
in drug delivery, helping drugs become more soluble or better absorbed in the body, and are also commonly used in hygiene products such as nappies and feminine products. When considered thoroughly, polymers play a key role in essentially all items of protective equipment, from the elastic ear loops on the face masks, to nitrile gloves formed from acrylonitrile and butadiene to form acrylonitrile butadiene rubber, to face shields and safety goggles formed from polycarbonates for example, and even the new physical barrier screens seen everywhere from TV sets to supermarket checkouts, which are commonly made from PP, PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate. Many polymers utilised in personal protective equipment are known as thermoplastics or thermosoftening plastic, a polymer that becomes malleable at high temperatures and sets upon cooling. These are polymers with high molecular weights, which when heated become more spaced out, thus reducing the intermolecular forces of attraction between them and allowing these polymers to be moulded. The point at which these polymers become more flexible is known as the glass transition temperature, or Tg. Below this temperature, polymers are in their glassy state, brittle and hard and can be easily broken. Above it, the polymers are in the rubbery state and become more malleable. Exploiting the varying TGs of different materials has allowed us to make leaps in 3D printing, which has also helped us in producing PPE during the pandemic. The glass transition temperature also helps us explain why nitrile gloves are formed from a copolymer of acrylonitrile and butadiene. The TG of acrylonitrile alone is 95 degrees Celsius, rendering any gloves made just from this material rather useless, as they will be hard and brittle. Forming a copolymer with butadiene allows us to reduce the TG to minus 38 degrees Celsius, giving us a useful, flexible material which is perfect for disposable gloves. COVID-19 testing is supposedly becoming a part of our new routine. Of course, without synthetic and natural polymers, we wouldn't be able to perform this key technique that can break chains of transmission and keep people safe. The more detailed PCR test, or polymerase chain reaction test, has been utilised throughout the pandemic. This technique, developed in 1983 by biochemist Kerry Mullis, allows for rapid replication of copies of a specific DNA sample, so it is amplified enough to be studied in detail. DNA is of course a natural polymer itself, a biomacromolecule, and this is key to identifying the virus. In COVID-19 PCR testing, swabs are processed so that RNA from samples is isolated and collected. Everything else is removed. The RNA is mixed with other ingredients, enzymes, DNA polymerase and reverse transcriptase, DNA building blocks, cofactors, probes and primers that recognise and bind to SARS-CoV-2. This converts the RNA to DNA so it can be detected by this method, and the sample then goes through a process of thermal cycling allowing for amplification of the initial sample to confirm the presence of viral DNA. This process also allows us to perform genomic sequencing on the sample, allowing us to safeguard against the potential for new COVID-19 variants. There are of course other methods of testing too, such as the now widespread rapid results testing, also known as lateral flow testing, that can be collected from pharmacies across the UK. These detect viral antigens in samples to indicate the presence of SARS-CoV-2, although concerns have been raised surrounding the accuracy of these tests and the potential for false positives. It is also clear that synthetic polymers play a key role in the swabs, sample tubes and many other areas of COVID-19 testing. Drugs discovered as therapeutic treatments to COVID-19 such as dexamethasone, which according to studies had saved an estimated 1 million lives thus far around the world, rely on polymers such as PET, polyethylene tetraphthalate, or PVC, polyvinyl chloride, for packaging to ensure the drugs continue stability and efficacy and ensure it is protected from sunlight, moisture, air and other factors that could affect the degradation of the drug. This therefore ensures patient safety. The strong hydrocarbon backbone within these macromolecules invokes the strong and durable properties needed for this purpose. Whilst the benefits of saving many lives and preventing transmission of COVID-19 make the use of plastics and PPE, medicines packaging and testing devices very favourable, there are concerns around the sustainability of single-use plastics. Plastics can take hundreds of years to degrade in nature and can also introduce microplastics into our environment, posing risks to wildlife. Most synthetic polymers are so durable due to their very strong hydrocarbon backbone. The strength of a carbon-carbon bond is 350 kilojoules per mole or thereabouts, so bond breaking would be unlikely to occur spontaneously. 
Around 86.3 million tonnes of PET and PVC are produced each year, but sustainability with plastics is increasing in some areas. Working in community pharmacy, we have recently commenced recycling medicines blister packets. Fast forward one year from the start of the pandemic, and the one thing that continues to give people hope is the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine, which I'm proud to be playing a part of. An immense amount of work has gone on both in view and behind the scenes to facilitate this program across the country and indeed around the world. One of the most groundbreaking areas of this global effort has been the introduction of mRNA, messenger ribonucleic acid vaccines, such as the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna vaccines, which would not have been possible without both synthetic and natural polymers. In brief, the vaccines work by injecting parts of the COVID-19 virus's RNA, specifically the part that instructs the cells what to build, which are contained in a lipid nanoparticle into a patient intramuscularly. This instructs cells to construct the COVID-19 spike protein, which then elicits an immune response from the body, allowing the patient to build antibodies and T-cells to prevent further infection from actual SARS-CoV-2. RNA is of course itself a key biomacromolecule, and the lipid nanoparticles used within the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna vaccines also contain polyethylene glycol, PEG, which is located on the surface of the nanoparticles and helps to stabilise the system and deliver the mRNA into the body and cells safely. There have been safety alerts, however, which directly to relate to the polymer utilised in the vaccine. There have been a very, very small number of cases of anaphylaxis reported when patients have received the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. This is where the body's immune system responds and overreacts to a certain excipient in the body and is a form of severe allergic reaction. Anaphylaxis is itself life-threatening if not treated swiftly. Scientists are currently hypothesising that the severity of this reaction could depend on the chain length of PEG used in the vaccine as it is the polyethylene glycol itself that causes the reaction in the first place. When this was first reported, this did affect vaccine confidence in some people, however the general uptake of all vaccines within the UK has been very good. I myself have been proud to receive two full doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine as a healthcare worker. To mitigate the risks, NHS England and the MHRA have also advised that a 15 minute mandatory wait time has to be observed post vaccination if you receive the Moderna or Pfizer BioNTech vaccines. There are, however, many advantages associated with these new mRNA vaccines. In contrast to the AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson vaccines, which use a live and attenuated adenovirus delivery methods, these vaccines have not been plagued with the exceptionally rare but unshakable reports of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, CVST, which has led to a decrease in vaccine confidence and limits to the use of AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson vaccines. There are also reports that the mRNA technology utilised in these COVID-19 vaccines could be used to cure cancer, HIV and more, with trials having been ongoing for a number of years. This would be a real game changer, an amazing example of how out of so much bad, a glimmer of hope for a healthier and happier future for everyone can emerge. Preliminary reports for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine also demonstrate that the vaccine to an extent cuts transmission, cuts hospitalisations and cuts serious illness, and the UK vaccination campaign using all MHRA emergency use authorised vaccines has saved over 6,000 lives so far. Every vaccination has helped to give us hope of a brighter future ahead. In fact, here is a picture that is close to my heart. On Friday the 2nd of April 2021, I administered the second dose of COVID-19 vaccine BNT162B2, also known as the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, to my grandmother at a local vaccination site I work at. As the vaccination campaign advances, I would implore everyone eligible to get their safe and effective vaccine and help protect yourself and others from the disease that has changed the world and the way we live.